by land, sea, and space. And Television Archive continues its look at Mattel's 1980 offerings for its home game machine. This installment doesn't focus neatly on a particular month as the past two have. Instead, we'll be taking a look at the last two games released during the console's test market phase, and two more that first debuted after the Intellivision went national. Mattel Electronics' focus on two-player games really continues through 1980, as two of the four games here really demand a second person, and a third is a pretty thin package when played solo. With that in mind, we'll start off with that single-player optional release, Auto Racing, which seems to have debuted around May. Auto Racing comes to us courtesy of Larry Zwick of APH Consulting. Zwick unfortunately passed away around the turn of the century of skin cancer, and this appears to have been his sole in television game credit. Though according to fellow APH developer David Rolfe, Zwick did develop the graphics routine used in the Atari VCS version of his Activision title, Beam Rider. With this in mind, there aren't too many details about Auto Racing's creation out in the world. We can infer a few things based on what we know about the creation of other sports titles for the Intellivision. For starters, undoubtedly the game was requested by Mattel Electronics of APH, as developers at the studio had no input into game ideas. It's also pretty likely that the art assets came from Mattel's internal staff and provided to Zwick at APH for use in the game, as has been the case for other games featured in this series so far. David James, in particular, was noted by Rolf as the artist who made most of the graphics in APH's releases. As you'd expect, Auto Racing tasks players with driving their car around the track. Obviously, racing games aren't new ground for video games, having been the subject of numerous coin-op titles in the 1970s, and Atari VCS games like Indy 500 and Street Racer by this point. But Auto Racing does a few things that were unusual for the time. The single-player mode, for example, is the only one that tracks your lap count, with the game finishing after five laps. The two-player races are instead score-based, with players earning points either by getting far enough ahead of the opponent that they manage to scroll off screen, or by their opponent crashing the car. After points are scored, the race is stopped and then restarted at a checkpoint. The first player to get 50 points wins the game. This makes Auto Racing's two-player mode an extremely strange stop-and-start affair, and while it's not a particularly elegant or even fun game mode, it is a clever approach to the problem of having two racers scroll off screen from one another. Additionally, Auto Racing gives you options. You have five different cars to choose from, each with different stats save for cars 4 and 5. Like with modern racing games, these differ in their acceleration, top speed, and handling abilities. Players also choose from one of five courses, or allow the computer to select one at random. The courses are increasingly difficult to navigate, which is expected, but more surprising is that the tracks are all on the same globe. This means that by carefully navigating around trees and buildings, you can drive onto any of the tracks you want, including a hidden drag strip. In a blessed choice compared to Indy 500, the cars in auto racing will constantly accelerate unless you push one of the side buttons, which will put on the brakes. This means you won't have nearly as much hand cramping action as the Atari driving controller could put on you after a lengthy Indy 500 session, but still allows you pretty solid control over your speed. More interestingly, the game features two steering modes dependent on the ROM revision. One version uses realistic steering, where players turn the car by pushing left or right on the disc, with the car turning directions based on its specific orientation. For example, if it were driving downward on the screen, pushing left would turn the car right, as the driver's left would be on the right side of the screen. Confused? Probably. Even the manual indicates this can take some getting used to. The other version uses what's known as intuitive steering, where the direction you turn is always oriented to the TV screen itself. If you push right on the disc, you'll always move to the right side of the screen, for example. This intuitive steering revision is a bit easier to wrap one's head around, though an easter egg was included to activate the realistic steering mode on a controller by pushing 1, 6, and 9 together on the keypad. This intuitive steering version appears to have been the original release. The Blue Sky Rangers website indicates the earliest manuals use these controls, and a review from 1981 mentions this as well. It seems plausible that the realistic driving controls were preferred by Zwick and snuck into the earlier version of the cartridge, and eventually the ROM was revised in the course of its production run to use only the realistic controls, either for the sake of realism or because it was something Mattel heard enough feedback over. And of course, realism is the order of the day for auto racing, much like Mattel's other sports titles. 
you can't really play this one like an arcade racer. There's a real effort here by Zwick to make turning your car a fairly realistic affair, which in turn means you really need to consider how you approach and handle turns. Personally, I'm very bad at those kinds of games, and as such I'm not particularly good at this one either, but I can see the appeal, and being able to leave the track and explore the map is a really cool easter egg. By any indication, Auto Racing was a very solid hit for Mattel. While it wasn't one of the company's top-selling games, through June 4th, 1983, Mattel Electronics shipped 565,200 copies, according to an internal sales memo. 43,000 of these came in its first year. Not super impressive for when it came out, but Auto Racing saw very solid sales in 1981 and 1982 that allowed it to catch up to some of its brethren like Armor Battle and NBA Basketball. It reviewed pretty well, too. Bill Kunkel and Arnie Katz called it the best game of its kind in their November 1981 column for video. While they enjoyed the selection of tracks and cars, they felt the two-player mode stop-and-start gameplay was awkward, and suggested having players simply compete solo and compare times. They followed by singling it out as among the best the Intellivision has to offer in the first issue of Electronic Games, and gushed about it further in the review section, praising its graphics and the play involving more than just revving up to top speed. Ultimately, the magazine gave it an Archie Award for Best Sports Game in 1982, praising the diversity of maps and vehicles and that the cars looked and steered like cars. TV Gamer in the UK considered it the best of the 12 games that were initially released in the territory, making this an early example of the stereotype that British players love realistic driving games. Video Games, meanwhile, gave the game high marks and wrote that it was a game of finesse, not speed or steering. Also apparently releasing in May is the final game of the test market period, we have NHL Hockey. This one comes to us from Ken Smith, who had previously written NBA Basketball and co-wrote NFL Football, two games we've already looked at in this series. Smith had been a summer hire at APH in 1978, as he was a student at Caltech for the rest of the year. His first summer saw him learning how to write software for the Intellivision, which was when he worked on NBA Basketball and helped salvage the NFL Football game before his work period came to a close. Smith returned the following summer of 1979 and was put to work on NHL Hockey. According to his 2014 interview with the Intellivision Aries podcast, he figured basketball had turned out well, so why not take up the hockey project too? Ironic, as Smith noted that he was even less of a hockey fan than he was of basketball. But he figured that while you have ice instead of a court and the nets are different, the two games are fairly similar at their core. Smith's impression of hockey was such that the important aspects of the sport he wanted to get across were the feeling of skating around the rink on ice, and that it was difficult to score points. For fun, he put in the ability to trip opposing players, using a random number generator to determine how long a player would be knocked down. Hal Finney, APH's go-to sound guy, did all the sound effects for NHL hockey, Smith added. As Smith intended, NHL hockey is indeed a tricky game to score well in. Mastering the momentum-based movement of the players is key, and much like real hockey, effective passing is important to keeping an offensive effort going. Getting the puck past the goalie does take some effective puck handling and teamwork, or otherwise sheer luck, but it's certainly doable. Of all the Mattel sports games we've seen so far, NHL hockey may be the one that requires the most dedication to really enjoy, but there is a solid game here for the time if the goal is to make something relatively realistic. NHL Hockey itself served as the inspiration for Activision's Ice Hockey for the VCS. As detailed in my video on that game, Alan Miller mentioned in the Video Invaders book that he didn't like the low-scoring approach to Smith's game and decided to make a version for the VCS that was fast-paced and had scores easily clearing the double-digit mark. Miller may have been onto something, as NHL Hockey was never a huge seller for Mattel, with a total of 307,600 copies shipped by June 1983. This isn't the lowest echelons of Intellivision game sales, but it is decidedly mediocre for a title in its sports line. Whether that's because hockey is a more regional sport, or due to the design, that's hard to say. We don't have any sales figures for Activision's Ice Hockey or the earlier Odyssey 2 rendition of the sport to compare against, unfortunately. NHL Hockey's game design was well received by Bill Kunkel and Arnie Katz in their February 1981 video column reviewing the title, however. They praised Smith's game for emphasizing aspects of the sport that other titles overlook, notably the checking aspects, the movement on ice, the passing and shooting game, and the usage of computer goalies. It's important to note that there weren't exactly a lot of hockey games on the market by this point aside from variants of Pong and Magnavox's own hockey game on the Odyssey 2, so the bar wasn't exactly high. They did give NHL Hockey the runner-up Archie Award in 1982 for Best Competitive Game. 
praising its emphasis on stick handling and precision shooting, though it did lose out to Activision's VCS game Tennis. NHL Hockey did serve as the basis for INTV's late era release Slapshot Super Pro Hockey, which, like the other Super Pro sports games on the Intellivision, is premised on adding a single player option to these sports games, among various other enhancements. In the case of Slapshot, a computer opponent is really the main thing that INTV had added to the original release, as well as the ability to perform a titular slap shot by shooting the puck in the direction the player is already skating. And that wraps it up for the test launch library. Four games from the earliest period in 1979, and another six debuting in the first part of the year. The Intellivision would begin to get national advertisements in May, about the same time as NHL Hockey and Auto Racing's apparent releases, and by the fall the console was widely available. As detailed in an earlier video, Mattel's early advertising focus was on the Intellivision as being expandable into a full computer, but by all indications this approach was not much of a success. By pivoting to a head-to-head -head comparison of their games against market leader Atari's, however, sales picked up. These comparisons early on focused heavily on sports games, but the next two releases on the console, which seemed to have hit stores starting in October, were the sorts of titles you could only see on a home video game platform. The first of these two we'll be looking at is Sea Battle, also by Ken Smith. According to Smith's Intellivisionaries podcast interview, Sea Battle was the second game he wrote over the summer of 1979 upon completing NHL hockey. Unlike his previous titles, however, he didn't have a sport to base the gameplay off of. He recalled that he was handed some graphic assets of ships done by Dave James and was asked to do something naval themed. What Smith came up with was an incredibly inventive and excellent game that mixes both strategy and tactical action as two players compete to take over their opponent's home base. The central premise of the game is that each player wants to try and successfully take over the opponent's base located on a large island in opposite corners of the map. To both accomplish this task and defend their own base, players each have 13 ships, deployable in up to four fleets at a time. These include aircraft carriers, battleships, destroyers, PT boats, submarines, troop transports, mine layers, and mine sweepers, each with different stats and attack methods. The keypad is used to build out these fleets and to select which one will be under direct control for maneuvering on the world map, though once you've got a fleet moving in a direction you can swap to another and let them continue doing their thing. This is also when mine layers can drop mines to halt enemy advances, and when mine sweepers can find and disable them. Once two fleets have approached one another, the game shifts to a combat mode, with each player starting with control over their flagships but with the ability to switch over to any other ships in the fleet at any time, with the fight going on until one fleet is completely destroyed or has retreated. Most ships use a targeting reticule to fire volleys at each other, though the submarine and PT boat use torpedoes instead. If a ship takes too much damage or runs aground, it sinks, and if the entire fleet sinks, then the opponent wins the day and can continue its movements. If your fleet is only partially destroyed or your ship's damaged, you can sail them back to your harbor for repairs and reassignment. Successfully sailing a fleet with a troop transport or aircraft carrier into the enemy's harbor will win the game. Although if both players have lost all of those ships already, any other ship can enter the harbor and win. This inventive design results in one of the best two-player games of its time, albeit one that does require usage of the keypad overlays and maybe a look through the manual. The map is suitably complex to navigate, the different stats of the ships provide a degree of strategy to fleet composition and usage, and matches really don't take all that long to end. The game really makes you want to go another round after each match, which is the mark of a great multiplayer title. Though there aren't as many words written for sea battle as there were for auto racing, the game did see some praise in its day. TV Gamer gushed about it as being Mattel's best battle game thanks to the complexity it introduces, despite its apparent simplicity. The game also gets a mention in an electronic games feature on war games, though only in the general sense of how it plays. But Sea Battle proved to be a solid seller for Mattel, with 529,200 copies shipped by June 1983. Sales appear to have been pretty solid through the reporting period, never reaching the rarefied heights of Major League Baseball or NFL football, but consistent nonetheless. Through 1981, Sea Battle was Mattel's fifth best-selling game, which meant when the company started producing games for the Atari VCS under the M Network label, Sea Battle was tapped as one to make the conversion. Larry Zwick and Bruce Pedersen developed this version, which simplified the game to work within the limitations of the VCS controller and hardware. The mine layers and mine sweepers were gone, as were the troop transports and carriers. Instead, each side is limited to battleships, destroyers, PT boats, and submarines. 
You no longer launch these ships in fleets, but rather one at a time, though players get no indication of what they're up against until the battle mode starts. There's no fleeing from a battle in this version, as they're all flights to the death, and any ship is capable of taking over the opposing harbor from the get-go. According to the Blue Sky Rangers website, this version almost went out under the name High Seas, but its release was cancelled when the company decided it didn't want to try and sell any more exclusively two-player games. A reasonable decision by 1982, though the complexity of Sea Battle's gameplay meant that there was little chance of working in a competent computer opponent. This version did eventually see the light of day at the 2000 Classic Gaming Expo, with a limited run of copies produced by Intellivision Productions, and Atari Age continues to sell reproductions of it as of this recording. After completing Sea Battle, Ken Smith eventually returned to APH to work on software for the ill-fated Intellivision keyboard component. He never ended up writing another game for the base hardware, however. Our final game for this video, Space Battle, was one of Mattel's biggest hits on the Intellivision, shipping 972,000 copies by June 1983 and showing the appetite for space games extended to Mattel's console too. Developed by Hal Finney, this game, much like Sea Battle, uses a worldview and a combat view as players work to defend their mothership from attacking alien ships that are absolutely just Cylon Raiders from Battlestar Galactica. To back things up a bit, recall that Star Wars was a monster hit in 1977, kicking off a new love affair with science fiction and space action media. Among other things, the practical effects were very well received, and amidst this hunger for more things like Star Wars, NBC approved first as a miniseries and then a full TV series, a show pitched by producer Glenn Larson called Battlestar Galactica. Battlestar was a show about a fleet of human spacecraft from the Twelve Colonies led by their last surviving warship as they flee their ruined worlds to try and find the mythical 13th colony, Earth, all while being hunted by the robotic Cylons, who had committed genocide against their planets in the first place. The show featured special effects from John Dykstra's studio, Dykstra having worked on Star Wars' effects, and the similarities to the effects in Star Wars showed. While Battlestar cost a shocking $1 million per episode to produce, the effects work, costume design, and set pieces were top-notch. The show was a hit, and Mattel Electronics managed to snag the game rights, repackaging an existing handheld game called Missile Attack into Battlestar Galactica Space Alert. The company had every intention of making a Battlestar-themed Intellivision game too, and Space Battle even appears under the Battlestar title in the 1979 Winter CES promotional video. According to a 2006 interview with Finney, Space Battle not only featured Battlestar-themed graphics, but a rendition of the show's main theme as well. Unfortunately, Mattel was unable to secure the rights to the franchise, so the theme was cut. That said, the game was still quite early in development at that time, and graphics were a low enough resolution that there was no need to bother changing the shape of the Cylon Raiders. Nevertheless, playing this game, it very much retains the aesthetics and the base premise of the TV show, Raiders aside. Space Battle starts players off in an overhead scanner view with a few squadrons of alien fighters approaching the center, which is where your flagship is located. The flagship can deploy three squadrons of fighters of its own, each consisting of three craft. A player decides which enemy group each of their squadrons will intercept, and once they have, the player then can jump into a combat view, which shifts to a first-person perspective, after a fashion. Here you control crosshairs on screen and must try and shoot down the enemy ships without letting their shots hit your own crosshairs. Combat mode ends when you've lost all of your fighters, you destroy all of their fighters, or you opt to leave direct control of the fight. This last point is important, because the clock is always ticking in space battle. If you're in a fight, enemy ships in your own squadrons are still flying, and if they overlap they will start fighting, with both sides losing fighters at a regular clip. Only since you have a lot fewer than the aliens do, letting the computer do the work for you is a strategy to lose your fighters and with them the game. Once an enemy squadron reaches the center of the scanner, an alarm will begin sounding as they begin attacking the flagship, which speeds up as it takes more damage. If you're unable to take down the enemy ships in time, it's destroyed and you lose the game. Take out all of the enemy squadrons and you get a little victory siren instead. Much like Sea Battle, Space Battle is a game about managing multiple activities in an effective manner so you don't get completely rocked. While there is a real compulsion to launch all three squadrons at once, ultimately you don't want to be in a situation where they all reach the enemy ships at the same time, lest you take unavoidable losses and leave your flagship vulnerable. With experience, you can get the hang of avoiding enemy fire with your crosshairs and identifying exactly when they become actively dangerous. So at that point, it's just a matter of timing your squadrons and cleaning up the enemy craft efficiently. It's possible to chain ship explosions together into each other, 
taking out additional fighters with the debris from the first craft, which always feels really good when it happens. Once you get the hang of it, Space Battle isn't too difficult a game to clear, even on the advanced game speed option, which is probably why the more common later runs of the game added in an additional super advanced speed option to try and make the game more difficult. After wrapping work on Space Battle, Finney appears to have also been tasked with helping work on software for the Intellivision keyboard component, notably conversational French and Jack LaLanne's physical conditioning. He eventually returned to the console itself to write Star Strike before being moved over to writing Atari VCS software under the M Network label. Finney eventually also developed the Atari VCS equivalent to Space Battle, Space Attack. This looked worse, and the enemy fighters aren't quite as complex in their attack routines, but overall it's a remarkably close translation of the original. The joystick is a bit more confusing to operate than the keypad when sending out fighters, as you need to use it to both identify target enemies and to send a particular squadron to them, but the learning curve isn't that steep. This was the fifth best-selling M-Network title, with 385,400 copies shipped by June 1983, putting it behind only Lock and Chase, Astro Blast, Super Challenge Football, and Super Challenge Baseball. Finney remarked in his 2006 interview that while the Intellivision was easier to program for thanks to its operating system and hardware perks, the VCS was more satisfying to work with because of how handcrafted the assembly language had to be to get a coherent picture out of it, let alone a game. The difficulty switches here adjust the aggressiveness of the enemy craft and provide a pretty good challenge. Bill Kunkel and Arnie Katz were awarded Space Battle the Best Science Fiction Game Archie Award for 1981, praising the tactical and strategic elements and how they are married to the visuals and enemy actions. The pair delve into this further in the first issue of Electronic Games, where it gets a full review. There they note that given the computer's limited effectiveness against the enemy squadrons, players need to be strategic in their deployments and only use computer-controlled engagements in an emergency or as a delaying tactic. Jumping ahead to a March 1982 edition of the magazine, they remark that in television games always seem to provide an extra dimension to whatever topic the game is using, and the strategic angle of space battle makes it a greater than a basic space shooter. TV Gamer wrote in their quick review of the game that this cousin to Star Raiders is one of the best space games on the Intellivision and worth saving up for. With space games having a moment at the time, Mattel would commission a few more space games that would hit store shelves in 1981. But Space Battle remains one of the best, and alongside Sea Battle was a stellar choice to join the Intellivision library in its national debut. Next time, we're trading in spacecraft for horses.